I'm going to be talking about a mystery that's been around for well over 200 years that hasn't been solved yet. I wish that in talking about this, I can bring some air conditioning to this spot. <laughs> we were talking about the woolly mammoths of the Ice Age, but uh, coming from 35 centimeters of snow and below zero, uh, it's, I've been, haven't stopped sweating yet. Anyway, whatever happened to the woolly mammoths? I'm going to make a point that uh, many mysteries are associated with the woolly mammoth, just not their extinction, but what were they doing in Siberia in the first place? Extinction theories have many problems. And that the quick freeze, which is the most popular idea based on the carcasses they find in the permafrost, is not likely. The evidence points to an extinction at the end of the Ice Age. And the post-flood ice age deduced from the Bible can account for the mysteries. What is a woolly mammoth? Well, in general, it's a hairy elephant, but in detail, it has a hump on its head, a hump on its shoulder, long hair about, oh, up to 18 inches, long curving inward spiraling tusks. And in general, they lived in the northern areas of the northern hemisphere. There was another mammoth that lived uh, south of the woolly mammoth, mostly, these are generalizations, called the Columbian mammoth in America. It's called, the, I believe it's called the imperial mammoth in Europe. Where do we find woolly mammoths? Well, here's where we find them, in the red area right here. From Alaska down through uh, northern North America. And you go over into the other side of the Atlantic, you find them in western Europe, eastward into Asia, into Siberia. You find them in some exotic places. For instance, on the bottom of the North Sea, you find a lot of them. You find a lot of them on the bottom of the Bering Sea. You find a lot of them on the continental shelves off Siberia. You find a lot on the Atlantic, on the continental shelves off the Atlantic. You find some uh, in the Sea of Japan. So there are a lot of areas where you find them, a lot of exotic areas. So in general, they stretch from one end of the, the northern hemisphere at high and mid latitudes to the other. Let's get a little geography lesson. I'm going to focus mainly on Siberia, because that's where the most interest lies. That's where you find these carcasses with half-decade vegetation and buttercups in their mouths, uh, things like this. Siberia starts at the Ural Mountains right in here. This is the Russian plain right here. Uh, this is color-coded by elevation. The light green is low altitude, and the browns are high altitude. So we have the mountains of Central Asia right in here. Most of Siberia is very low and flat, right in here. This is western Siberia. Eastern Siberia is more mountainous, except near the coast, right in here. Out in here, it's pretty mountainous. Now, these are the New Siberian Islands, and these have a lot of woolly mammoth bones on those islands right there. And I'm going to make mention of that off and on, the New Siberian Islands, and how come we have so many woolly mammoth bones on those islands. Now, it's kind of interesting that during the Ice Age, I'm going to make a point that, that they didn't die in the flood, but they died at the end of the Ice Age. It's interesting that in the Ice Age, that mainly the mountains of Siberia and Alaska were glaciated. The lowlands that you see in yellow here were not glaciated at all. This is a major mystery from the Uniformitarian Ice Age models. In fact, they run climate simulations or Ice Age simulations and some of the first places to glaciate in their models are Siberia and Alaska, both mountains and lowlands both. So they got a problem. Why weren't the lowlands glaciated? They were never glaciated. And that's where you find the woolly mammoths that lived and died. They've been greatly surprised over the years by the bones and tusks you find in permafrost. Now permafrost is permanently frozen soil. It's, it's up to about 500 meters thick, maybe 600 meters thick in Siberia and Alaska. But at the top of this permafrost, you find this chock full of bones and tusks of woolly mammoth. By the way, there wasn't just mammoths up there. There were a lot of other animals like horses, bisons, woolly rhinoceroses, uh, beavers, sega antelope, uh, lots of other animals. You find that the bones and tusks are generally well preserved. Why aren't they so rotted? Uh, you know, these are questions. How fa why did they get in the permafrost? Also, what really has surprised them is these frozen carcasses. There's, uh, well, I'll get into that later. How come they, they got these frozen carcasses with flesh on them in the permafrost? And the stomach contents, you can identify some of the plants that they last ate. 
from their stomach contents. It's only half digested. Why is that? And the New Siberian Islands, like I said, are, are, have lots of bones on them. How come they're so concentrated on the New Siberian Islands? First of all, you've got to ask the question, are we just talking about a few woolly mammoths, or are we talking about many? How many woolly mammoths are there in Siberia? Well, to find that out, I went to the experts that have been studying mammoths for years. The, the top Soviet expert is Nikolai Bereshigin, and he was quoted in Smithsonian Magazine saying this, through such causes, almost 50,000 mammoth tusks are said to have been found in Siberia between 1660 and 1915, serving an extensive mammoth ivory trade. But this is nothing compared to those still buried, according to Berish again, who calculates that the heavy erosion of the Arctic coast spills thousands of tusks and tens of thousands of buried bones each year into the sea, and that along the 600-mile coastal shallows between the Yana and Kolme rivers lie more than a half a million tons of mammoth tusks, with another 150,000 tons in the bottom of the lakes of the coastal plain. What does that mean? If a tusk weighs 100 pounds, He's talking about five million mammoths buried between the Yana and the Kolme rivers in Siberia, a 600 mile stretch. Five million. So those that believe that there's millions of mammoths in the permafrost up there are, are correct. Now there's some uniformitarian scientists say, oh, there's only 50,000. I would say they're definitely wrong. I'm going to mainly focus on three mysteries, but especially on the last one. But there's, there's just more than uh, to explain besides how they died up there. First of all, why would they live in Siberia? If you know anything about the climate of Siberia, it, winter is cold and, and, and dark most of the winter. In the summer, the land is boggy. Because of the permafrost, the top uh, one or two feet melt, and it has nowhere to drain. It can't drain down through the permafrost, it's rock hard, so it flows only slow and it forms all this muskeg and swamp. And it's hard to get around in Siberia in the summertime because of that bog. It'd be very hard for an elephant to live up in Siberia today as a result. Number two, what would the mammals eat? There's no green vegetation in northern Siberia until July. And if they're anything like an elephant, which they're very close to uh, elephants, is that they probably need somewhere around 200 kilograms of fresh vegetation daily and about 50 gallons, 30 to 50 gallons of water a day. Tremendous requirements, and yet there's hardly any green vegetation. There's lots of round vegetation. They could probably subsist on that, but no green vegetation until July today in northern Siberia. And bog vegetation, but Siberia is luxurious with vegetation today. And the, a lot of uniformitarians say, oh, there's plenty to eat but it's bog vegetation. Bog vegetation from paleoecologists is toxic to mammoths or, or elephants. It's toxic. These were grazers. They ate grass or low bushes. So they couldn't subsist on the vegetation that grows there today. Number three, how did they die? Now I visited the first two subjects uh, when I wrote my first book on the Ice Age, uh, uh, an Ice Age caused by the Genesis Flood. And I didn't think that uh, I'd ever find a reasonable solution to the third one, but I should have kept going because I revisited it about four years ago, and I think I have a reasonable solution to how they died also. Well, obviously, is it possible they could have migrated up there? Well, there's lots of problems with that. First of all, uh, the, the young ones couldn't make it. And we're talking about thousands of miles of migration. And a woolly mammoth, uh, when it's pregnant, its gestation period is 22 months. So it'd have to make the journey up there and back and back again, and then possibly a fourth time while being pregnant. That's pretty tough. So it's not likely, and uniformitarian scientists agree, it's not likely they migrated back and forth. Besides, summer, summers are not ideal up there either because of the bog. So migration is out. We can examine the environment based on the animals we find there, and the mystery actually deepens. The more we learn about the, the animals up there, the more the mystery deepens. For instance, there's a wide diversity of animals up there, just not the woolly mammoth. I mentioned some of them. Burrowing mammals. There's burrowing mammals and beavers. Do burrowing mammals love permafrost, for instance? There's badgers and ferrets up there. Most of the mammals were grazers. In fact, practically all of them were grazers. They ate grass. There's very little grassland in Siberia today. 
wildlife specialists would call them well-dressed giants, big horns, uh, shaggy uh, uh, coats, but in general they're well-dressed giants. Many of those mammals now live further south. These are clues that we can use to try to figure out these mysteries, not just the mystery of how they died, but how they, why they lived up there, and what they ate, and then how they died. What can we deduce? First of all, we can deduce that it was a grassland with a wide diversity of plants, because there was a wide diversity of animals, there had to be a wide diversity of plants for them to eat, because they all have different uh, requirements for eating plants. You have to conclude from that it was a fertile soil, unlike today. You can conclude or deduce that it's a high quality habitat with light competition. That's why they're well-dressed giants, as wildlife specialists would describe them. Vegetation requires, for this kind of vegetation, requires a long growing season with warm soil and rapid spring growth, quite unlike the environment up there today. You can also deduce that the snowfall was light and it would melt early. They had milder, relatively dry winters, and summer bogs would be rare, and little or no permafrost. That is a radical deduction based on what you find up there, and it's totally rejected by uniformitarians, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's still a mystery after well over 200 years of banging their head against the wall, trying to figure out why we can't explain why we have all these hairy elephants up in Siberia as well as Alaska and the Yukon Territory, I might add. To give you more insight into the lack of permafrost, this is the distribution, historical distribution, of the Saga antelope. It's a, it's a type, we have the pronghorn antelope in Montana. It's a little tiny animal that runs really fast. It's like a little deer. This is the distribution now and in the recent past, but this is the Ice Age distribution, these dots. They ranged widely. They ranged way up into Siberia, clear to the coast, and even on the New Siberian Islands up in here, Northeast Siberia, even Northern Alaska, the Northern Yukon Territory, Central Alaska. What does that mean? It means that antelope have small hooves, and they can't handle permafrost. They gotta have solid substrate and open spaces, indicating that when they, they find these bones in, up here, that, that this area likely did not have permafrost. So woolly mammoth is, extinction is a major mystery. Tomachov wrote in 1929, we must explain the extinction of an animal which was living in great numbers, apparently very prosperously over a large area in variable physical geographical conditions to which it was well adapted and which died out in a short time geologically speaking. Well adapted to the environment. Suddenly it's gone, not only in Siberia, Alaska, and Yukon, but over the entire northern hemisphere. Peter Ward said in 1997 in the Call of the Distant Mammoth, this great extinction, truly a mass extinction, represents one of paleontology's most fundamental mysteries. The mystery deepens further when we examine the carcasses in a little more detail. There's a number of puzzles when you look at the carcasses. This, I already mentioned the half decayed vegetation in their stomach. This is a major mystery because that vegetation should be totally digested or decayed. It's kind of interesting that some of these animals are found in a generally standing upright position in the permafrost. How did that happen? Five animals are known to suffocate based on the, the coagulation of blood and other features. Five of them suffocated. By the way, three of those were woolly mammoths and two were woolly rhinoceroses. And, uh, some of the bones were broken, like in the Beresavaca mammoth, which I'll show a picture. It had a broken forearm, broken ribs, and a broken pelvis. How do we explain these broken bones? Also, it has to be entombed rapidly into permafrost or it decays, and the tusks will, will decay also in a short, fairly short time. So how do you entomb it into hard rock permafrost? Here's the Beresavaca mammoth. That's the way it was found, even though it, it slid or, or slumped down into the river. That's probably the general position it died, and the slump just didn't, it did not disturb it as it came down. It just came down in a massive flow and onto the, uh, close to the Beresavaca River in northeast Siberia. It's in a general standing position. 
This is another animal they find in a general standing position. This is how they find it down here. It was found in a gold mine and they used to put lanterns on its paws to light the, the mine tunnel. That's what, they, that's what you observe. So they dug it out and found out it was headless, first of all, and it's in a general standing position. So here's how uh, uh, Dale Guthrie at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, who I think is the closest uniformitarian scientist to understanding what's going on there, this is how he think it, it died. It, it slipped in a bog and, and sunk in a bog in a general standing position. And a lion came by and ate off its head, and then a mass flow came and covered up until it was 26 feet deep, and then the, the miners came and found the lower portion of it. There's one problem with this scenario. You look at the, uh, the material around it, the sediments around it, and it's not bog sediments. It's something else. So he's got the right idea, I think, but I think it's the wrong, he's got some things wrong with it. It's not a bog, but it's in a general standing position. Tomachov also said, speaking of the, uh, the general uh, standing position, he says, Brandt, who was an early Siberian explorer, was very much impressed by the fact that remnants of the mammoth, carcasses and skeletons alike, just not the carcasses, sometimes, remember sometimes, this is not the normal, this is rather the rare cases, I might add, sometimes were found in poses which indicated that the animals had perished standing upright as though they had been bogged. See, they, that's what you'd normally think of. They got caught in a bog, even though there's not bog sediments around them. There's some other type of sediments. Henry Howorth in The Mammoth and the Flood in 1887. By the way, this flood was not the Genesis flood. He tried to explain the extinction of the woolly mammoths by being buried in a flood, a low flood that swept all across Siberia. He said, now by no physical process known to us can we understand how soft flesh could thus be buried in ground while it's still frozen as hard as flint without disintegrating it. We cannot push an elephant's body into a mass of solid ice or hard frozen gravel and clay without entirely destroying the fine articulations and pounding the whole mass into a jelly. Nor would we fail in greatly disturbing the ground in the process. How do we get it into the permafrost? So these, are, these carcasses present some major mysteries that have not been solved today. Now there's three categories of mammoth extinction theories. There's a uniformitarian ideas which says that, well, the climate wasn't much different. But you know, I think they're out of touch with reality. The more we know about those animals up there, the more the climate has to be greatly different. I already don't think they've faced the situation. Then there's the non-creationist catastrophists, as I call them. Henry Holworth, I mentioned him. Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote uh, to some very provocative books in the 1950s on astrocatastrophe and, and astrocatastrophism where Venus and Mars were moving through the solar system and the mammoth was one of the major reasons he wrote those books. Earth and Upheaval is another one of them. The mammoth is one of the major reasons he wrote those, those books. And then Ivan Sanderson and Charles Hapgood. Now Velikovsky believes that these, when Mars or Venus got close to the Earth, it perturbed the orb tilt and it went like this, the Earth went like that. So the woolly mammoths were pleasantly grazing in the subtropics and suddenly were brought up to uh, the North Pole and frozen instantly. That's his idea. It's, uh, it's a, a catastrophic, but it's uh, what I call the non-creation ca uh, catastrophe. Now, Ivan Sanderson and Habgood believe instead of the poles shifting, the crust of the Earth shifted up there and then back. These are pretty wild ideas. <laughs> and these were non-creations, by the way. And then, of course, creationists would be wondering about them. And, of course, we were split into generally two camps. Actually, there's a third camp that I just found out about. Number one, a quick freeze early in the flood. That's what, how a lot of creationists have tried to explain it over the years. And another group of creationists has said uh, it's at the end of the post-flood rapid ice age. Now, when I examined this in the 1980s, I thought the evidence was very strong in favor of death at the end of an ice age. And I'll tell you why pretty soon. Those are Velikovsky's two major books. Now, many people have never heard of Velikovsky. I've uh, taken polls in audiences, and very few people even remember him. But he, he was a very interesting character. But he was prone to exaggeration. In speaking of the deposits in Alaska, where you find the mammoths, he described it like this. Under what conditions 
did this great slaughter take place in which millions upon millions of animals were torn limb from limb and mingled with uprooted trees. He's speaking of what's called muck in Alaska. That's what the gold miners call it when they wash it away to get at the gravel below. It's called muck. And that's where you find the vast majority of vegetation and animals, and they are sort of mingled uh, chaotically. But there's a reason for that. Muck is mainly the material that they're buried in, but it's been slumped down and mixed by mass movement. That's it's re uh, really not a, a mystery. Now there's pretty strong evidence that they didn't die in the flood. First of all, why focus just on Siberia? They're part of a mammoth steppe community. A steppe is a, is a dry grassland community that stretches from the Atlantic clear through Asia to the Pacific down into North America. Why just focus on Siberia? They're just part of this whole steppe community so you'd expect that, that whatever that, and by the way, in this other, these other areas, they're obviously post-flood. So you gotta connect the Siberian ones with the others, I would say, because they're all part of a post-flood mammoth steppe community. Also, you find woolly mammoths on cave walls in, in Europe, and then as clear close to Siberia as the Ural Mountains. And that is so close to Siberia. By the way, cave paintings are not a flood phenomenon, they're a post-flood phenomenon. Also, and this is one of the most significant ones, bones are found on top of glacial till. Till is the uh, debris from the Ice Age where you have rocks of all sizes mixed with a finer grain matrix. The bones of woolly mammoths are found on top of glacial till in northwest Siberia. Northwest Siberia was glaciated, and the mammoths like to live, it's apparently, close to the ice. And when the ice receded, they just walked right up there and they died right on top of the glacial till. Well, that's not, that's a flood death. I mean, that's a, a Ice Age death, not a flood death. And they're also found in surficial sediments. Now, if they died early in the flood, they would be at the bottom of the sedimentary rocks in Siberia. And they're not. You don't find them there. You find them always in the surficial sediments at the top. So it's pretty strong that they did not die in the flood. And there's strong evidence against the quick freeze itself, I might add, which is their mechanism that they use to, to, for them to go extinct during the flood. What are some of those evidences against the quick freeze? First of all, when we talk about mammoth carcasses, we're only talking about a very few. There's only, a, I'd say, as far as mammoth and other carcasses, there's probably a dozen whole carcasses we're talking about of the millions of bones that, and tusks that they find up there. And by the way, they define carcasses as any scrap of flesh. So if you define it that way, we got probably less than a hundred carcasses, and whole carcasses about a dozen. So we're talking about a very small number compared to, the, to all the mammoths that were up there. So why have a theory just for them? You gotta have a theory for the majority of them and try to figure out the, the, the rare exceptions after the, the general theory. Also, you hear stories that, uh, that um, Men ate mammoth steaks and things like this. Now, I couldn't verify that, but I know they know that dogs have eaten mammoth. But, uh, and the reason they say that is because, well, because this meat was so fresh that you could do that. Well, actually, according to the experts, the, the, a lot of it, or practically all of it, is partially decayed. Some of it looks fresh, but as soon as it's unfrozen, it's, just, it's brown, it stinks right away, so it's already partially decayed. And by the way, a quick freeze would freeze it instantly, and it would be fresh, and you could eat mammoth steaks. And also you find fly pupae by the thousands, not only in the bones, also in the carcasses. Not while they're exposed, but after you dig them up, you find these pupae, indicating that they sat around for a while under normal death and burial, and flies came in there. Now a quick freeze would freeze it solidly, and they'd have to thaw out for that to happen, but in the scenario with the, the flood, they get quickly frozen and buried right away, which has no time for fly pupae to, or flies to get on these carcasses. Also, when you examine the vegetation in the stomach, you can deduce, now this is uh, more speculative, but you can deduce by the, the type of vegetation, the state of the flowering, that there's different seasons of death. If it was a quick freeze during the flood, it would happen at the same instant. So because of the different seasons, and by the way, a lot of times it's late summer or early fall is what a lot of them are, but there is indication that, that some of them died in the winter time. 
In a quick freeze, it would be in an instant, in one season, whatever that would be, was. Also in Siberia, for some reason, most of the remains are mammoths. And we know that there's a lot of other animals up there. In fact, all through the Northern Hemisphere, we find these other animals that live with them. But in Siberia, it seems like the other animals had time to escape. A quick freeze would freeze all the animals up there in their tracks. And I believe we'd find a lot more animals besides a majority of my woolly mammoths. I think we'd find a lot more besides just a majority of woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoths would be a minority. Also, stomach contents are found in partially preserved USA mastodons in the Northeast US. There, now, you find a lot of mastodons, which is kind of like a cousin to a woolly mammoth, and you, they're found in bogs in the Northeast, and a number of occasions they have found stomach remains you can identify in these mastodons, and, and no one would say that they were quick frozen. Why they are preserved like that is not quite sure, but it at least says that it can ha if it happened other places, it likely wasn't a quick freeze in Siberia. So there's some pretty strong arguments against a quick freeze. So the other, only solution left is that they died at the end of the Ice Age. I think that answers most of the questions. So you, that brings up the question, if it wasn't a quick freeze, how do we account for the half-decayed vegetation in their stomach? Good question. Well, I'm not quite sure, but I think it could be because of the di digestive system of an elephant. It's different than a cow in that most of the digestion takes place after the stomach. The stomach is mainly a holding pouch for vegetation. It's acidic, and the acids will break down some of the vegetation, but it doesn't have microorganisms that do the digestion in, a, in an elephant. For instance, Gary Haynes says in Mammoth, Macedons, and Elephants, the digestive system is based on post-gastric hindgut fermentation. That is digestion after the stomach into the intestines. The stomach is, a lar is large, but serves mainly to store ingested food. In other words, it's just a storage pouch waiting for ingest, uh, digestion. Enzymes within the stomach partly break down the vegetation, but most nutrients are extracted in the huge cecum and large intestine, where microbes ferment the food remaining after gastric processing. So I think it's possible that it's because the digestion doesn't take place in the stomach that if you froze it fairly quick, not instantaneously, by the way, those that believe in instant quick freeze believe that suddenly the temperature dropped to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I, I, I can't translate that at the moment to centigrade, but that's very cold. Suddenly, that's what they believe to, to account for that state of vegetation in their stomach. But we might not need to account for that. We can say maybe it was a gradual freeze because the, the, the stomach contents remained in a half decayed state and stayed that way until it was, it was frozen slowly. So that's a possibility I'm throwing out. I need to find more information about that. Therefore, if uh, the Uniformitarians can't explain it and the non-creationist catastrophists have a lot of serious problems, well, what about us? Can we explain it at the end of the Ice Age? Can a post-flood Ice Age model account for these mammoth mysteries? I think it accounts for most of them. I believe the Genesis flood fulfills the requirements for an ice age, first of all. So at the end of the, of the flood, you'd have all this volcanic ash and aerosols trapped in the stratosphere. And that reflects sunlight back to space. So that would cause cooling over the large continental areas at mid and high latitudes, mainly in summertime. So that would be the mechanism for the cooler summers you need for an ice age. What about all the, the snow you need for an ice age? Well, the fountains of the Great Deep whatever that was, probably springs or water trapped under the crust that would be warm, spilled out during the flood, you'd end up with warm water, pole to pole and top to bottom at the end of the flood. The significance of this is that the warmer the water, the more the evaporation. And it'd be at mid and high latitude, so you'd evaporate a lot more water into the atmosphere for the ice age to occur. This mechanism would persist, but it would wane with time as the volcanism, post-flood volcanism, would slow down and the ocean cools off. I did some calculations on this, and the post-flood ice age is a, takes about approximately 500 years based on the cooling time of the oceans. Deglaciation is very rapid based on the uh, energy balance over a snow cover. It's about 100 to 200 years. So the total time for an ice age is approximately 700 years. Now, focusing more on Siberia, 
why they would live up there. First of all, it wouldn't be that cold during this kind of ice age. A guy did an experiment. Uh, he just took the, the sea ice off the Arctic Ocean for the winter time, but left the temperature at the freezing point of seawater, which is about minus two degrees centigrade. And winters warmed this much, 40 degrees near the North Pole. See northern Siberia, it warmed 20 degrees centigrade just by getting rid of the sea ice. But what if the temperature was 70, 80 degrees at the end of the flood? It'd be a lot warmer in Siberia, right up in here in Alaska where the woolly mammoth lives. So all this warmth plus other mechanisms for warmth during this ice age, this unique ice age, would end up with a lot warmer climate in Siberia. In fact, you have a lot of onshore flow of warm air from the Arctic Ocean and also the North Pacific Ocean and also the storm belt would, would be in here, so it would be stormy and wet for quite a while, and a lot warmer in Asia, in, in Siberia. So these are, based on the post-flood ice age, I think these are significant factors why the woolly mammoth would even want to live in Siberia. It wasn't bitterly cold like, like it is today. There was no permafrost. Then the question is, if it's a 700-year ice age, do we have enough time for millions of mammoths? If there was 5 million between the Yana and the Coma River, you could probably say there's 10, 15 million mammoths probably buried in the permafrost. Do we have time in a 700-year ice age for 15 million mammoths? How are we gonna find out? Well, I did a lot of study of the gestation period of elephants and their doubling time and this sort of thing. The best thing is to, to go to the South Africa and figure out the doubling times in various environments. Now here's one doubling time in one environment in 25 years. You, in 25 years, you can have 8 million mammoths in 550 million years at a doubling time of every 25 years from two individuals that left the ark, or maybe they're the elephant kind and the mammoth genes got uh, through natural selection, uh, became, uh, got uh, split off to form the mammoth, whatever, it doesn't really matter, but because the doubling time in 25 years, you'd have approximately uh, 8,550 years. I'm not going to talk about that. that's an intermediate figure, but in one I found in 10 years they doubled. Now there's a lot of different preserves in Africa and there, some are protected, there's a lot of poaching and lots of stuff like this, so there's a lot of variability. That's why I got uh, different doubling times. So if, if I use this, this 10 years, which would uh, probably approximate the, the er, early post-flood period when the environment was rich, there are no predators, they would multiply rapidly, you can have 1.3 billion in 300 years. So it's not really not a problem getting millions of mammoths after the flood in a rapid uh, post-flood ice age. Now here's kind of a timeline of the mammoths. Whether it's an elephant kind that leaves the ark or a mammoth kind doesn't matter, but regardless, the mammoths, uh, they, they start off slowly. Time goes to the right and the number goes up to the left. And they increase slowly, but then they really mushroom. And towards the peak of the ice age, it becomes colder and drier and windy, as I will talk about. And suddenly, they go extinct to zero at the end of the ice age. That's the uh, mammoth timeline since the time of the flood. Now, as the ice age builds, sea level lowers because it's the water from the ocean that ends up as ice. So as sea level lowers, you end up shallowing out that very shallow Bering Land Bridge and uh, the shelf off northern Siberia right in here. And that would allow woolly mammoths to spread not only to Siberia, and by the way, I don't think they spread up there right away. I think it was pretty wet and warm, and probably trees grew right after the flood, but it cooled off, dried, and I think it would be a lot better environment, say about uh, 200 years after the flood. But regardless, they could spread from Siberia across the Bering Land Bridge, down through what's called an ice-free corridor, down through where I live, right in there, before the ice covered it up in there. That's, I believe, the migration of the woolly mammoths. Man, I think, took this route right in here. I don't think any animals uh, went down there, but, but uh, both man and animals probably took both routes. But mammoths spread through North America that way. What about the temperatures of Siberia? To give you a better picture of how I think these are postulated. I emphasize postulated because there's no way to know that. I think right at the end of the flood, you had very little seasonal contrast, and it was fairly mild in Siberia. But as time went on, it gradually cooled, and, the, and you had more of a seasonal contrast, to the point where at the end of the Ice Age, it got very cold, colder than today, and winters were quite cold, and summers were 
were cold too, but they, they all uh, rebounded afterwards. So that's the timeline for temperature. For precipitation, because you had a lot more evaporation early in the flood, I think the evaporation was high, precip was high, but, but as the time went on, it, the oceans cooled, the ice formed, you had a lot more reasons for a drier climate, and this is where I think the animals spread up into Siberia, right in here, and because it continued to dry, and they got caught in cold, drought, and uh, other factors I'll get into. And permafrost, I think you had no permafrost at the end of the flood, by definition, because of the warm water and because of the newly deposited sediments. And the permafrost would start building slowly, slowly, and by the time you get to the end of the Ice Age, probably a lot of permafrost. And I think because of warming after the end of the Ice Age, caused by the melting of the ice sheets, like the Siberian, excuse me, the Scandinavian ice sheet and the ice sheets in North America, you had a warming trend. You had a warming trend since the end of the Ice Age up there. That's just to give you an idea of the temperatures and precipitation surrounding the life and death of the, the mammoths in Siberia. So three mysteries. Why live in Siberia? First of all, it was probably a lot warmer. I, can't, I don't think we can do anything about the darkness. But a lot of animals live in the dark. In fact, uh, in Montana, most of the, the big game animals, they come out and feed at night. So the dark doesn't really bother them at all. But it wasn't bitterly cold up there, and it wasn't a bog land in the summer. You probably had some bogs here and there, but it wasn't too boggy. It was mostly a grassland, so that's why they can live in Siberia. What would they eat? Well, a grassland is very rich, and they fed on grass and low bushes, and so there was plenty to eat in the vast expanse. It's a huge area uh, in Siberia and the lowlands of, of Alaska and, and uh, Yukon. No bog vegetation. Then the third question, how did they die? This is the most mysterious of all. Here's what I... I think you have to do to find out how they die. I examine what is the sediment that they're found in. Are they found in bog sediments? Are they found in river sediments, round gravel, or what? Well, the best way to find out is to go to the experts that study them. And you know, it's kind of interesting <laughs> what they say. A particular interest for the paleozoologists is the Odama. Now, they're found in these Odamas. They're like hills. And the only hills because the permafrost is melted around it and left some permafrost unmelted in hills. That's all there is. But the significant thing about these areas is that, that, that the material is actually a lust layer as a rule containing the largest amount of remains of late Pleistocene animals. Lust is windblown silt, mostly silt, little clay, little sand. They're found in dust storm deposits. So, that uh, presents a good possibility. They can, uh, dust storms can account for a lot of these. And Guthrie, Dale Guthrie, says in his book Frozen Fauna of the Mammoth Steppe, like most of the Soviet Far East, large expanses of Alaska and the Yukon Territory were not glaciated during the Pleistocene. Because these areas were bounded on several sides by enormous glaciers, that's in the mountains, there you had mountain glaciers, and glacial outwash streams, Today, much of Beringia, that is eastern Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon, is mantled with a thick deposit of aeolian, that is windblown silt called lus. So the experts say they're, they're found in windblown silt. So the idea, they believe they were buried in dust storms. Now, I believe that, that most of them died normal deaths, and the dust just covered them up. And the permafrost came up and to meet them. They didn't have to be jammed in the permafrost. In fact, I went to the Dust Bowl, and some of these uh, dust storms during the Dust Bowl era were huge. Some of them were like blizzards that had drifts six feet tall, covering machinery up to uh, the gables on a, a two-story building. So I would say that's probably a good analog, not only to cover a lot of the, the mammoths that died normally, but I think it can account for the mammoth uh, carcasses. First of all, why did we have dust storms? Why would we have dust storms late in the Ice Age? Well, first of all, colder winters. Colder oceans means less evaporation, drier air, and you had more sea ice to cause more cold, and a drier atmosphere, of course, and you had a stronger north-south temperature difference. That drives the upper winds. The stronger the north-south temperature difference, the stronger the upper winds. And so you had a lot stronger winds, dry storms. So it's just a natural, uh, meteorological phenomenon at the end of the Ice Age. Can this Ice Age uh, explain the carcass puzzles? 
Well, I believe I've already uh, gave you an, a reasonable explanation for the half decayed vegetation. How about the standing upright? Is it possible that you had a woolly mammoth standing out and he got caught in a dust storm and he tried to ride it out and the dust packed up around him like in a blizzard uh, packs up around a, a snow fence and it packed in and kept him in a standing position. He died in a standing position. Do you think that's possible? I think it's, it's likely that that could account for them being in a standing position. Also, these dust storms can suffocate them. They can breathe in so much dust from these strong winds that they could suffocate. Or it's possible that even one of these gigantic dust storms could totally cover a mammoth. And the broken bones, I'll get into that later. It's possible to explain that that way. And you can entomb them rapidly in permafrost because the permafrost comes up into the newly deposited dust. So they automatically get put into the permafrost from the up, the, the, uh, moving up. The broken bones. Now there's two types of the broken bones. There's the, the arm bones. I think the arm bones on the bear sabaka mammoth are the one now that was uh, broken while he was alive because of the blood all, uh, in the tissues. I think uh, the way that probably can be explained is they're trying to move around in this packed dust. When this dust packs, it's kind of like, almost like cement around you. You can hardly move. It snows the same way, I might add. And so he could have broken his bones by the torsion. You know, there's a place in South Dakota called Hot Springs, South Dakota, where a number of the the mammoths they found in a sinkhole, 52 mammoths, some of them have broken arm bones. And Larry Agenbrod, an expert on woolly mammoths or mammoths in general, says the processes that would provide such breakage are limited to only two. And I think we can exclude number two. But number one, torsional stress as provided by trying to extricate a limb mired in mud, muck, quicksand, etc. So I think because of, the, of what you had at Hot Springs, South Dakota in the USA, I think that could explain the broken bones in the bear savaka mammoth uh, trying to extricate itself from windblown silt packing up around it. The other bones, like the broken pelvis and broken ribs, I think could be explained by shifting permafrost. Permafrost is known to shift 10 to 15 meters, and when that shifts, you know, if there's an animal in there, it breaks, it'll break its bones. So let's tie it all together here. These are a series, of uh, cartoon series. Uh, that Dan Leitha drew for me. Here's a woolly mammoth pleasantly eating grass and of course buttercups. We find buttercups in their stomach and in their, their mouth. And suddenly, uh oh, the wind's picking up and I'll turn my back and the dust starts packing around them. By the way, this is only for the carcasses, not the normal death and burial. These are the extreme cases. These are gigantic windstorms. And it continues to pack around them. He breathes it in, he suffocates in a general standing position. And he either gets covered or eventually gets covered. And in, uh, then the permafrost comes up to meet him. And then it shifts to break his pelvis. This is a quickie to kind of give you an idea how gigantic dust arms are a reasonable explanation to account for the, uh, the mammoths up there. Why can't mainstream geologists see the importance of windblown silt? As, a, as an explanation for the mammoth mysteries, which has been around for over 200 years. It's because of their time scale. For instance, Barish again says, one important factor was the fall of lust on the cold, wet ground. However, this deposition can hardly have exceeded two to three centimeters. He is generous for a uniformitarian. Two to three centimeters of dust accumulation a year. But he says even at that rate, it would take 20 to 30 years to cover a mammoth, during which time the bones and tusks would have been almost entirely destroyed. So even at his rate, you couldn't preserve them. Uh, Dale Guthrie is even less pessimistic. He says, these large bones could not be preserved by a few millimeters of annual aeolian lust fall. Their preservation requires large quantities of reworked silt. They can't see it because they stretch out the time for the, the, the silt deposited in Siberia. They cannot see because of their stretched out time scale. Time is not a side issue. I'm finding that time is a help to solve a number of these mysteries of, of the recent past. By the way, the New Siberian Islands are probably chock full of bones because I believe rapid sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age, they would find themselves in the continental shells with the water coming up pretty fast, and they go to higher land, which is the New Siberian Islands, 
and the sea came around them and they ended up being on an island with hardly any food and that's why I believe you have so many there. Why did so many mammals, large mammals and birds go extinct worldwide at the ice age? I think it's due to dust storms, cold, drought and probably fires. So the Puss Blow Sled Rapid Ice Age accounts for the lowlands of Siberia not glaciated, why mammoths lived in Siberia in the first place, I believe it can account for the mix of warm and cold climate animals you find in Siberia and all across the northern hemisphere I might add, the abundance of food in the grass of, in Siberia, how mammoths and other animals went extinct. A reasonable explanation for the many mammoth mysteries are provided by the post-flood rapid ice age. This ice age is a climate consequence of Noah's flood. This supports the Bible and is against the present processes over millions of years alternative hypothesis. Thank you.